Welcome to the quest for the best medium-sized SUV of 2024. It's a segment that makes up more than 20% of sales, and subsequently, there are a lot of different makes and models to choose from. We've done the hard work for you, and today we'll present our top five. They all make a very strong case, but there's also a clear winner. And don't forget, at any point in time, you can use the time codes below to skip to a certain section. Now let's get started. We drove 14 different models lined up around a price point of $50,000 or as close as press fleet availability would allow. Sadly, the Cherry Tigo Pro 7 couldn't make it and the Hyundai Tucson fell over at the last moment, though that's about to be updated anyway. Each car was evaluated on five criteria, safety, technology, comfort and convenience, driving performance and ownership costs. With the scores tallied, we whittled down the list until we were left with a clear top five. Though to be honest, the whole top 10 are worthwhile. But check out the written review at carsales.com.au for more information. And so we're left with a top five, which I'll now introduce in alphabetical order. The freshest car here is the Honda CR-V, and the VTi L7 tested here is one of the few mid-sizes to offer seven seat flexibility. What's this, another Honda? The brand's decision to offer two similarly sized SUVs might seem odd, but they successfully target different buyers. And at this price point, you're getting the top spec ZRV RS Hybrid. Our reigning champion is the Kia Sportage GT line. It's clearly still a quality contender, but can it retain its title in the face of new and heavily updated opposition? The Nissan X-Trail can also be had with seven seats, but at this price point, you're looking at a petrol-powered TI, though an e-power hybrid can be had for similar money. Then there's the Toyota RAV4, the world's second most popular car last year, represented here in XSE two-wheel drive hybrid guys. I'll take you through each car's cabin from front to rear and take them for a drive, while also detailing each car's running costs safety and equipment levels. Let's get started with the Honda CR-V. Like most new generation Hondas, the CR-V's interior feels really well put together. It's not groundbreaking or particularly flashy, but it does have some nice design elements and a real sense of build quality. Not only are there plenty of buttons and dials, but they turn and touch in a very satisfying way as well. The driving position, it's really solid, and there's also plenty of space for odds and sods up front here. And despite this being a mid-ish spec variant, I've got heated electric adjust seats, wireless charging, an eight speaker sound system, and a sunroof. The nine inch infotainment screen isn't the biggest, but it's functional and has wireless Apple CarPlay. The Android Auto is wired. In addition, it also has app functionality. Switching into the Honda ZRV, which brings some improvements and some compromises compared to its sibling. The look and feel, the overall design feels very similar, but it's just not as well put together in here, and some of the materials aren't as nice either. On the plus side, you get much better in cabin storage with the use of this space under the console here. And for virtually the same money as the CRV, you get the fully loaded RS model. In addition to the CRV's equipment, you get a heated steering wheel, full digital display, a 12 speaker sound system, though no sunroof, and the infotainment screen is essentially the same in its function and features. Step in the Kia Sportage after the two Hondas and it's a definite wow factor. This massive curved screen, the full digital display, the rotary gear selector, it's all those little touches that make it feel quite swish especially when you consider that the price tag isn't much more expensive than most of the other cars here. And it's not just glitz, the material feels really nice. It's got good storage. It's not great storage, but good storage. Ergonomically, it's very sound. It's a really functional space. And these seats are heated and ventilated, the only vehicle here to offer such luxury. 
This digital panel, however, is pretty divisive. At the flick of a button, it switches between climate and audio controls all in this panel. We think it's a pretty clever use of space. We like it, but not everyone is so keen. Also, this rotary dial looks pretty cool, but it can be a little bit tricky when you're trying to do a three-point turn. The screens are excellent though. Bigger is better when it means you have higher resolution imagery and larger icons to press, though smartphone mirroring is wired only. Moving to the X-Trail, and Nissan has done an excellent job with this cabin with a lot of thoughtful details. Let's start with this really cleverly carved out area under the center console, it's genius space for storage. We've also got a head-up display in this TI spec trim. It's the only vehicle of the five on test to have that technology. Plenty of leather bound surfaces, wireless phone charging, a full glass sunroof, a really nice steering wheel, and plenty of logically labeled physical buttons. I'm not totally sold on the contrasting brown trim, but that is a personal preference. In this TI trim level, you get the widescreen infotainment system, which works well even natively, especially if you take the time to customize the layout with your frequently used functions. The RAV4 isn't the flashiest place to sit, to be honest, but it's probably less of an issue at this XSE trim level. If you're at the cruiser or edge at the higher trim, you might be worried, but this is the lower price point. Some of the materials are a little bit questionable, but these blue highlights kind of bring it together nicely for a sporty vibe. And when I say sporty, I mean more like rock climbing, not really Formula One sporty. There's some decent storage. You've got a cubby hole in front of the driver's knee, another one in front of the passenger, as well as the usual array in the center here. And the RAV4 finally has got an upgraded infotainment system, wireless Apple CarPlay. It works well, it's intuitive, SatNav works well, and it's also got app connectivity, but it's only complimentary for one year. All these five have all the basics covered and then some. The Kia impresses with the size and clarity of its infotainment, though it doesn't have the wireless smartphone mirroring capability of the others. With the vast majority of mid-size SUVs being pressed into family duties, this second row is as important, if not more important, than the front seating position. And the CRV wins major points for the amount of space back here. There's heaps. And while this raised seating position does mean that headroom can be a little tight for taller occupants, it's actually really good for shorter ones because they can see out the window, which is really handy. Now, this bench slides and reclines, and there's two of everything back here. Air vents, USB-C points, and ISOVIX positions. The CRV is also unique among this quintet in offering seven seats. And while the third row is extremely cramped and also impacts on boot space, there is no denying its usefulness when it comes to kids' sports carpooling. Despite being half a size smaller than the CRV, the Honda ZRV has plenty of room in the second row. Accommodating adults will not be a problem, and these outboard seats are heated. And like its larger sibling, it has two air vents, two charge points, and ISOFIX positions. Accommodation is palatial in the back of the Sportage. You have room to move in every direction. It doesn't have heated seats, but it does tick a lot of other boxes. You've got USB-C ports here. You've got a hook here for a bag or a piece of clothing, perhaps air vents here, another hook here. If I was to be picky, I'd say that the indoor bottle storage could be a little bit larger. The X-Trail is another car that has masses of room in the second row, and it's easy to get in and out because these doors also open the full 90 degrees. X-Trail's not the only one to do that. It just goes that little bit further. Now, the bench also slides. You've got tri-zone climate control, and the center armrest here folds down and gives you access to the boot as well. Now, the absence of window shades isn't unique to the X-Trail either, but it's just a bit disappointing given that the closely related Outlander has them as standard. It just would have been the icing on the cake. As you can see, there is plenty of space in the second row of the RAV4, but one thing worth noting is that these doors, they don't open to that full 90 degrees like a lot of the other cars on test here, so it can make things like loading kids in car seats a little bit trickier. Other basic amenities are pretty well covered, although this bench seat doesn't slide, but you've still got two air vents, two charge points, fold-down armrest with cup holders. 
It's just one of those things that the RAV4 doesn't do anything particularly wrong, but it's just that the others do it much better. As you would hope in such a family-friendly segment, all of these five have the major bases covered and then some. But the Kia Sportage sets the standard with a level of equipment none of the others can match, though the ZRV and X-Trail get close. In this trim level, the CRV's boot space is hampered by the third row of seating. If you don't need seven seats, get the five seater. It's got plenty of room. And like all cars on test, you'll find an electric tailgate. Also, the boot floor is not totally flat because of that raised seating, but there's still a generous amount of load space if you need it. Like we saw with the second row, the ZRV's smaller dimensions don't actually hurt it much when it comes to luggage space either. There's really not much in it. The Sportage has loads of space and it manages to do that while still having a full spare tire. Go Kia! It's also really well thought out. You've got bag hooks, a net, little cubby holes on the side, levers to flip the second row seats and more anchor points. Well done. The X-Trail also has heaps of space and while it's got the usual tie down points and a 12 volt outlet, it's got a really cool point of difference as well. These floor compartments create separate areas for your boot space. So think about things like putting your groceries up here and your dirty sports equipment down the back. It's a really cool feature. The RAV4 has a really competitive boot load space as well, and you get a netted area, some tie down points and a 12 volt outlet, but there's no underfloor storage and you also only get a space saver spare tire. There are a couple of standouts when it comes to running costs and it's the Honda ZRV and Toyota RAV4. Both hybrids provide fuel economy advantages, but servicing is also very affordable and expected residual values are extremely strong. In comparison, the Sportage and X-Trail are expensive to service and the Nissan is relatively thirsty, though the Kia has the benefit of a seven year warranty. Jack of all trades, master of none, probably slightly undersells the CRV. It's an accomplished and well rounded vehicle. It just doesn't necessarily set any new benchmarks in any particular area. It's easy to drive, it's comfortable, it's pretty quiet, and it's got enough oomph when you need it. Although it's more of a functional rather than an inspired experience. And for the most part, for people buying in this segment, that's going to be more than enough. Even on unsealed roads, the CRV is composed and performs well. Although the lane departure warning or lane departure mitigation, as Honda calls it, can get a little confused and it's way too keen to intervene on country roads. It's an issue that also afflicts the ZRV. Compared to the CRV, again, it does some things better and some things worse. The ride in the ZRV doesn't feel quite as settled. There isn't much in it, but it just feels a little jittery. And it also doesn't have the same smooth power delivery as the CRV's turbo, but that hybrid driveline is mighty impressive, especially as it'll drop into EV power mode even when you're cruising at 110 k's an hour, saving your fuel. As our reigning champ, it won't come as any surprise to you to hear that the Kia Sportage is great to drive. It's incredibly polished. Kia's local suspension tuning team waved its magic wand over the Sportage, and the result is a car that rides with compliance and control. It's a car that drives with confidence regardless of the conditions. Being the only all-wheel drive here does have its benefits. It's worth noting though that the RAV4, CRV and X-Trail also have that option. Diesel is falling out of favour, but there's still something to be said for plentiful torque and fuel efficiency. The Nissan X-Trail shares a lot of its mechanicals with the Mitsubishi Outlander, so it's surprising just how different these two are to drive. And it's advantage Nissan as well, with a calmer, more comfortable drive and better steering. It just makes this car a more comfortable and nicer car for an everyday drive. 
The X-Trail's weakest point is its engine. Even unladen, it's working pretty hard. So you can imagine with a full load of people and luggage that it's going to struggle a little bit. Now Nissan does have a solution for this with its X-Trail e-Power models. And I won't go into all the details here, but essentially it has the benefits of an electric vehicle, but with the flexibility of a petrol powertrain, it's well worth considering. The RAV4's hybrid drivetrain puts that petrol X-Trail into perspective. Toyota has been doing hybrids for decades and the RAV4 is a great example. It's punchy and responsive when you need it to be, but it can also be quiet and efficient. But probably the most surprising thing is just how good it is to drive. It's not a nameplate that has historically been associated with uh, dynamic excellence, but there is a strong case that the RAV4 is actually the most accomplished vehicle on test here. It feels composed and it's comfortable and it deals with all of the normal natural Aussie roads with ease, whether they're urban, rural, unsealed. It's actually really enjoyable to drive. Now the moment you've been waiting for, the final rankings. Though remember, these are the top five vehicles from 14 mid-size SUVs on test. You really can't go wrong with any of these vehicles. And the final scores were really, really close, with second and 11th place separated by just five points from a possible 100. However, in fifth place, we have the Honda CRV a great, well-rounded family car that will slip into your family life with the greatest of ease, particularly if you're chasing seven seats. To be honest, there are no real demerits here. Its place is more a result of the other cars doing things just a little bit better rather than any deficiency on the CRV's part. It's a similar story with the X-Trail. It's great to drive, easy and comfortable, but it's a little pricey to service and the engine is a little underwhelming. We'd suggest you explore the X-Trail e-Power models or the STL, which is a little cheaper than this TI model or the TI e-Power, which is a little more expensive, but you will save money at the petrol station. Tied in second place is the Honda ZRV. It's more than half a size smaller footprint, hasn't really done it too much damage. As with its 50 grandish price tag, you get the flagship hybrid RS with more kit and lower running costs. Now also being that size smaller, it might not be quite as child friendly. You don't get the third row of seating, but it has plenty of room in the second row and really good boot space. The ZRV probably isn't on too many people's shopping lists, but we really think it should be. Which brings us to a vehicle that is on a lot of people's shopping lists, the Toyota RAV4, and it's very easy to see why. This car just does so much right. Affordable to buy, cheap to run, super practical, comfortable, fun to drive, and now with competitive technology. It's a great car if you can stand the wait list. While we've driven a lot of great cars during this process, there's still quite a gap to our champion, which shows just how good the current Kia Sportage is. It drives as good as anything here, has loads of space, a seven year warranty, lots of little touches that are a point of difference, but also make it feel like a premium product for a very reasonable price. The diesel is the best bet, but you get the same kit in the turbo petrol for about $3,000 less. Well done, Kia, the 2024 Car Sales Best Midsize SUV Award.